Welcome to the Golfish Podcast. I'm your host, Amy Goodman. We're changing things up for the rest of spring and summer and moving the podcast to release every other week. As always, we will continue to bring you fascinating interviews with the people behind the players of the PGA, LPGA, Champions Tour, and beyond. Don't forget to rate or leave a review and tell us how we're doing. You've probably heard the hype, but have you actually considered incorporating CBD into your golf routine? If so, we're confident that our sponsors over at Joint Caddy will make you a CBD believer. Their topical freeze gel is perfect for anyone who experiences aches and pains on the course. It's equipped with a unique roll-on applicator that eliminates any chance of greasy hands affecting your grip and fits perfectly in your golf bag. Or maybe you fall victim to the back nine jitters. Joint Caddy also carries their own blend of oral drops that can help you relax, focus, and ease anxiety of those downhill four-footers. They're also great for sleep so you can dream about that perfect round. All of Joint Caddy's products are cultivated from only the highest quality industrial hemp and free of any solvents, fillers, artificial flavorings, sweeteners, or preservatives. They even have the third-party test results listed right on their website. So head to jointcaddy.com and see what the hype's all about. And while you're there, use promo code GOLFISHJC20 to take 20% off any order. This week, we are thrilled to have Mark Emmelman join us. Mark is a broadcaster, author, and golf coach. You may know him from his podcast, On the Mark, his broadcasting with CBS Sports and PGA Tour.com, or even as Trevor Emmelman's older brother. Mark and I talk about all things golf, what it was like moving from South Africa to Texas and now settling down in Georgia, and his impressive feats at Columbus State University. If you want a better look behind the scenes of the PGA Tour, are curious about Mark's journey around the world and how he obviously has more hours in the day than anyone I know, then this episode's for you. Let's get started. Hey, Mark. Amy, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm fine. Do I get to see you or not? Oh, sure. I will turn mine on. Hold on one second. Don't be, don't be alarmed. <laughs> Come on now. Hello. How are you? Good. Can you see me? Oh, there I am. Perfect, you know what? Yeah. My it is super dark in our office on on my side of the office. So my husband is right over here. He's going to pop in and say hi. Um, <laughs> hey, Rich, how are you? <laughs> um, his office has a little bit more of the light, so we just is that added. Is that dark yeah, you're fine. Um, so we just added a second desk in our office area because he was working at the office, and I was using that desk, and now. He cannot go into the office, so we're we're just kind of figuring it all out, you know, just like everybody yeah, else. Perfect. Everyone in your family healthy and well, I'm sure. Yes, yes, we are. We are. Um, we're pretty locked down here in Ohio still, um, and especially us. We are due in two and a half weeks, so um, we are just avoiding the outside altogether. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, fire away. Pull the trigger when yeah, you're ready. Yeah, absolutely. So super excited to have you on here today, Mark. I cannot tell you how much we appreciate this. Um, tell us about who you are for anyone that is listening that is literally living under a rock that does not know <laughs> who Mark Immelman is. Um, I'm South African by birth. I'm now an American citizen, became a citizen here in 2016. Uh, but honestly, um, at 49 years of age, I've spent more than half of my life in the United States. Um Came over here for a year um, in, back in 1985, and we lived in Dallas for a bit, our family. And then came back to college in the early 90s, played college golf um, at Columbus State University, and then graduated and moved on. And I was teaching golf on the European tour, and then I moved back to South Africa for a while and opened up a golf facility there. And then um, Columbus State, well, when I was there, it was Columbus College, called me up and my old coach offered me the job or said I should come and interview for the job as uh, the co- the golf coach at Columbus State. And I was interested because it was a way to get back into the United States. Mm-hmm. And so my well, she wife to be there, and then Tracy and I, we flew over here. We were both living in London at the time. I was teaching on a European tour and came and interviewed, and I was offered the job. And so we moved to Columbus, Georgia in 2001. And so I've been the the coach, now director of golf there since then, 
I'm still there. Um, and from there, you know, I've always been a teacher. I'm a teacher at heart, really. I, I guess that's my bent. So I was teaching golf at the time and just moving time between college golf and, and the pros and such. And then an opportunity in radio opened up and I did some PGA Tour radio announcing for a while. And that that kind of morphed into um, an analyst job with PGA Tour Live. And some of my work there got me noticed by the folks at CBS Sports. And now all of a sudden I'm part of the CBS Sports <laughs> Network golf crew. So all very serendipitous life. But, you know, I'm just a golf person um, who loves golf and has been very, very fortunate and very, very lucky to uh, to have, you know, sort of experienced all sides of the equation, to be honest. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When when I was doing research for the podcast for, for this particular interview, I was like, so one of the questions I need to ask Mark is how he has so many more hours in the day than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't understand how he has like nine jobs and still has sanity. <laughs> I've got a very supportive cast around me. My wife is an angel because um, there's a lot of travel involved, obviously, with the mm-hmm. announcing. And and, you know, there's sacrifices that are made, uh, but but thankfully, you know, with a lot of what I do, there's, there's so much synergy between the jobs, between the announcing and the podcast and, uh, and, and the coaching, you know, there's, as I say, there, there, there's the teaching thread that sort of binds all of these together. So yeah. you know, time is tight at times. Um, I think if there's something that sort of suffers, sadly, it's, it's the home life, but, you know, being, being uh, locked up at home now for a few, for a few <laughs> weeks with this, with COVID-19 pandemic has been great. Um, well, from that point of view, I should right. say it's great. But anyway, it's it's demanding time-wise, but, but thankfully, all the jobs seem to work together and thus far have been able to keep all the balls in the air. Yeah, absolutely. So I'd love to go back to what you talked about with moving here from South Africa. You said you were in Dallas for a year, moved back home, and then you came to what was then um, Columbus College, now Columbus State. How did you find Columbus, Georgia? Well, it was my first brush with Georgia. Before then, we had been to Florida, you know, as a a family traveling to the States, you've got to go to Disney World, which yes. we did. And, <laughs> and then we moved to just between, basically Arlington, Texas, so between um, Dallas and Fort Worth. So coming to Georgia the first time, um, I remember being struck as to how many trees there were. I mean, it's a yes. really wooded place. Yes. And so that was the first deal. And we had been in Dallas, so I had an experience with the heat. But the humidity down in Georgia was off the charts. And that took some getting used to. Um, obviously my accent sort of stood out like a sore thumb (laughs) and, and I think it, well, it's garnered me some intrigue my entire career and it sort of adds 10 IQ points, but down here in the (laughs) South, I had to learn to speak a lot slower. Um, and I learned, I learned the, I learned the value of appreciating, you know, barbecue and cool stuff like that. And, and George is home. I mean, we've been back here in Columbus since 2001. So coming to college was a bit of, it wasn't an upheaval, but it took some getting used to. Um, culture was all different. Mm-hmm. Golf courses were different. Um, expectations were different. Um, and so it took a little getting used to. But the truth of it is, for someone like myself back then, it was the chance of a lifetime. And you, you've got to grab it with both hands and, and make the most of the opportunity. So I, I managed to, and, and I had some success while I was in college. Yeah, you had some success, three-time All-American, two-time academic All-American, you know, it doesn't sound like it took you too long to get used to the courses, um, the American courses versus South African courses. I'll be honest with you, Amy, for the first, I'll I'll never forget the first couple months here, um, I was playing horrible. Um, I, obviously, when you're playing badly, um, it it heightens emotion. Mm Mm-hmm. And after the after the first three events in my college career, I didn't qualify for the starting team, and so I was morose by about this stage, and I was ready to ready to pack it up and go home. <laughs> and, and, and you know, back then in 1991, there wasn't FaceTime and right. you know, cell phone calls and skyping, and so I remember being on a phone to my dad saying, "I can't do this. I want to come home." And he said to me, "Just stick it out." And then my fourth event, the fourth event of the fall back then, I managed to qualify. I had a huge lead going into the final day on the fifth, uh, on the sixth place guy. And uh, I fumbled my way in there to beat him by one and earn a spot in the team. And, and I played well in the first event, and that sort of gave me traction. And then with that came some self-belief. 
And funnily enough, that Christmas I got to go home, which was one of only two times in my four and a half year tenure. tenure. Oh, wow. It was so expensive. Yeah. And I remember going home and I was looking forward to going home because obviously it was home. But I got back there and I suddenly realized playing on my old home course how much my game had improved. And I shot some crazy low scores back <laughs> home. And, and for a guy that was wanting to say, okay, this was it, I was done, I couldn't wait to get back. And then the whole thing just sort of snowballed and gained momentum from there. That's crazy. What are the differences between U.S. courses and South African courses? I would say difficulty. Um, okay. A lot of the South African courses are a little shorter because where I grew up, there's a lot of wind influence, sort of like a pebble beach. I mean, we're coastal. So the golf, the golf courses are basically defined by wind conditions. Okay. If there's no wind, they're receptive and they're easy and they're soft. The targets there are smaller, you know, greens are smaller and they're not as well bunkered. But here you might have some big targets green wise, but there's lots of bunkers and lots of penalty areas and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that's the first one. And, and then, you know, golf in South Africa, there's not as much money as America. So there's some modern style golf courses, but the old ones that we grew up on, you know, they, they've only got like two or three sets of tees where in the United States you can have four or five. Mm-hmm. You can play golf courses at different lengths over here, where in South Africa you can't really. Okay. Uh, and so I would say the courses here, by and large, are more difficult. Okay. Um, and, and I think the Champions Bermuda Greens, once you figure them out, are easier to putt than the Poanio we have down there in South Africa. Your dad was the commissioner of the Sunshine Tour. Is that how you got your start in golf, or did that happen after you were kind of already golfing? No, that happened well after we were involved. My dad was, he was a good athlete himself. And when I began playing at age 13, um, he just sort of grew an interest. In it. And he, him and my mom just would watch. And then my brother, who was nine years my junior, sort of tagged along. And then uh, my father was offered the job as the commissioner. Heck, I was living here in America. So it was, what, wow. in the early 2000s. So, okay. you know, he had been around golf so much and been involved in junior golf because he had two sons that played that mm -hmm. he'd sort of earned some goodwill, if you will. And then he'd been, you know, he'd held a significantly high position in industry over there. And and so his resume basically got him the job. He was asked to go back. He was living here in the States at the time, asked to go back and take the job. And, and I think as I look back, and certainly as he looks back, it was probably the most fun time of his career. Um, I'm sure he'd love to do it again. Uh, and, and it was, they, they got to experience some really cool things when my father was involved there with the sunshine tour. So I know Trevor played on sunshine for a little bit. Did you ever end up playing on that tour as well? I played, I, I graduated from college. I played three events as a professional, um, one over here in the States and I finished 10th. And then I had a, went back to South Africa and had a couple of missed cuts, but money was honestly a little tight. And so I, I'd, and the seasons are opposite. So I had played here in the summertime, which was win winter down there, went home for Christmas, which was summer. And I was like, okay, hopefully I can get some momentum playing now. Mm -hmm. And I missed the first two cuts. And so I was a little down. And then they went into the Christmas break. And during that break, I met a gentleman called Ian Todd, who was basically Mark McCormack's 2IC at IMG. And we played some golf together. And Next thing, they were offering me a job, <laughs> and I was suddenly like, whoa, hold on a second. You know, this could be an easier way to make money. So I kind of gave up, I guess, my purpose, but in the end, it worked out fine because from IMG came golf instruction, and from golf instruction, right. you know, we ended up where we are here. Right, right. So what is, I mean, what is it like playing with Trevor now? Because I, I believe from <laughs> what I've read online, you're his coach, too. So is it like used to be. you used to be, okay. So do you, yeah. did you used to come down with the hammer? Like I'm a big brother, listen to me. Or was <laughs> it like you, you kind of know what you're doing. I'm just helping fine tune. Uh, strangely things changed. You know, when I was, when I was, um, you know, what early twenties and he was in the teens, he'd be a lot more prone to listening. And then all of a sudden <laughs> when he started to win uh, global events, you know, then it became more debating and, and more just collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was his, his instructor, you know, we've known each other for so long and I'd know, watched him come up. So I sort of knew his golfing DNA. And so when I was the teacher, I was never really bombastic in my delivery with him. You know, it was more pitch him something and allow him to self-discover, if you mm -hmm. will, because I believe in self-discovery because then you really own what you're doing. Um, 
but, but no, if playing golf together now, we, if, if there's any help, uh, I, it's just, you know, he'll ask a question, I'll give my opinion, and then we'll sort of just talk about it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Do you guys get to play? I mean, he is still in South Africa. He lives in South Africa full time, and you're in Georgia. No, no, he's, that right? he's, he's no, he's down there in Orlando. He's oh, he's in Orlando, Orlando now. Okay, okay. So how? But no, I in terms mean, of us playing, in terms of us playing together, I think the last time we played together was <laughs> it was more than five years ago. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, you know, just I mean, just it's the, it's the age old truth, you know. Um, the if someone wants to get into golf, the worst thing you can do is work in golf. Yeah. If you want to play more golf, you you can't be a golf professional or club professional. Um, you certainly cannot be a broadcast person because there's so much time spent, you know, mm-hmm. after hours and such. And so, uh, I think right now, I, last year I played four rounds of golf. So this oh, year wow. I'm, I've I've got a leg up on it. I'm into two, and we're in <laughs> the fifth month of the year. So. If if the trend continues, I might I might I might break my uh, <laughs> my number of last, last year. years. I we had people ask us that a lot when when we first started this. They're like, "Oh my gosh, you must be able to get out all the time, and this must be such a a big part of your life now." And I'm like, "Nope." <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, it really is like working on the podcast. And I mean, obviously, we do a fraction of what you do. And I mean, it's so true. Like, it's so hard to take that time to get out because there's just so many other things happening and going on. Well, that's the truth. And and what folks don't realize is like with yours and, and with mine, if let's say I'm I'm home and I'm giving a day's worth of golf lessons, you know, when I'm done, I don't want to go and play golf yeah. necessarily. <laughs> I want to get inside and get some air conditioning and spend some time with the family. And, Absolutely. And when I'm back from, you know, I go to these exotic places as an announcer and I, yes, I'd love to play them, but when we're done with work for the day, you know, I'd, I'd much rather, you know, get together with my colleagues or whatever and just have a glass of wine and dinner and sort of reminisce than yeah. go and play. But I'm not going to turn up, turn away the opportunity to play, but it's just like I don't make decisions around it, I guess. Right, right. So do your, um, you talked about your family a lot. Do your girls play golf? <laughs> they both do. They're both pretty good. Um, my 12 year old Isabel has got a real flair for it. I mean, she plays kind of under duress when she does she plays well and she wins some little tournaments but it's just she's not she can't be bothered with a practice too much <laughs> because she's good at a lot of other things i mean she's a, a gymnast and she's a pianist and and she does well in school so that she's got the other interests yeah and then my younger sophia she's like trevor was with me she just picks it up because big sister is doing it mm-hmm. and it's kind of a way to get dad's attention, I guess, too. Um, but she's also athletic, so she can she can do well. She's done drive, chip, and putt. And, oh, cool. Uh, so, but again, it's golf is more a hobby with them right mm-hmm. now than what it's a thing. Yeah, I saw um, them practicing their chip shot or their trick shots <laughs> online. Those were cute. The flying yeah, donut. Was, <laughs> yeah, the, well, that was um, – I'm doing these things, obviously, with CBS. We're yeah. doing the, the rewinds, the replays, you know, for content on the weekends. and. So they're looking for interesting ways just to sort of engage the fan. And, yeah. and uh, I sort of became the face of their trick shot stuff. And they're looking for folks to send submission to, to submit videos. So I said to my girls, I'm like, why don't you do this? So we were outside there the one afternoon. It was a sunny afternoon. And so I said to Sophia, we'll grab the floaty, this round donut, <laughs> yeah. this blow up thing. And you jump and see if Izzy can chip it toward me <laughs> and basically make it go through. And after like the seventh take, they pulled it off. And That's so awesome. They, yeah, I, they 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 keen on the potential to see it on television. So yeah. that's <laughs> that always helps. That always helps. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they need some. Uh, they need some things to do. What right is it? <laughs> what is it like right now um, for Georgia golf with COVID? I mean, is is everything open? Are some things open? Like we just opened our rec courses. Private courses had been open and semi-private, but rec courses had not been open until I think like last week. So I'm always fascinated to know like what's going on in in other states. It was the same with us. Um, members' courses were open and there were clubhouses were closed. You know, same. if members yep. wanted to go and get food, they'd do take out just like any other restaurant or something. Um, but the courses were open and there were no f- rakes in the bunkers and no flag sticks in the greens and that sort of stuff. Um, and, and members were playing, they couldn't take guests Okay. and the municipal courses around our area were closed, but they've just opened up here recently, um, with, with Georgia opening up for business, Mm -hmm. but golf had been happening. Um, you know, folks had 
be, fortunately been out to been able to go out and play golf. So they were staying involved, which was good for folks around here. But obviously, you had to be cognizant of of the social distancing, distancing and right. the CDC guidelines. Right. How is it impacting? Um, so you're the director of golf for Columbus State. How is this impacting your players? I mean, I would assume they are not all from Georgia, so they're probably from all around the country. Um, and different states are able to do different things right now. How are they continuing to prepare for when when they're able to come back to school and play again? Well, the truth of it is, um, we're very international, our group, both on the men's and the ladies' side. Um, I've got um, the young lady from Spain. I've got a young man from Switzerland. I've got a couple from Argentina. Oh, wow. Um so we're very global. There's a couple of ladies from Germany and a few guys from England. And over there in Europe, it was basically locked down in your house. Right, right. So the first time the young lady from Spain got to get outside of the house and go for a walk was just a couple of days ago. Gosh. So they've had no golf whatsoever. Um, uh, we've we won uh, our number one player, a young man from Australia. He stayed in town here Okay. where the rest of them all went home. Um, and so because he stayed in town, he's been able to play golf. So he sort of had the leg up, but my advice to them when this whole thing was so unsure, I was like, I'd rather you go and be with your families because Mm -hmm. all the learning became online anyway, than you stay over here and have to stay in housing or whatever the case might be. And, and and so they all went home. And so some of them have been able to practice. Um, some of them have set up little practice stations with like a, a mat against a fence or something Mm -hmm. they could hit it to. Um, but that's been about the extent of it. Um, we have recommended to them just some exercise they could do inside the house. But, you know, I've been I've been sort of lenient with them. You know, to, to me, it's more about staying healthy right now and just, you know, sort of cherishing the time spent with family than really, you know, investing in your golf game. Yeah. Uh, because, we won't get an opportunity like this again, realistically. No. no well, that's the thing. And and. And I want folks, because it's an emotional time, I don't think a lot of folks realize the toll it takes on one. Mm-hmm. And um, I just wanted them to be with their families and so they can sort of be balanced, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Because golf will always be there and golf can come back. But, you know, if, if you're battling yourself mentally and emotionally and you're not connecting with your family, it could be a time of strife and I didn't want it to be that way. Yeah. I can't – yeah. I mean, I, I it's different – as you are an adult and you can make decisions and you're with someone like my husband and I have been at home for eight weeks together. We see each other a lot more than we normally (laughs) do. Um, But as I can't imagine going through this as a college student and especially a college student that may choose to stay at school, um, like your, your player from Australia did to make that decision right now. And, and really like, after a couple of weeks, be like, wait a second, was this the, <laughs> was this the right decision? Like, what was I doing? But it's got to be just so different because everything, everything about their end of college experience, especially if you have any seniors, is just totally turned on its head. Yeah, we have two seniors, one on the men's side, one on the ladies' side. The young man is from South Africa, and he went. His brother works in London, and so he went to be with his brother and. He's been locked down. He hadn't played golf in, what's this, six, seven weeks or whatever now. Uh, And now with the NCAA rules where they say they haven't sacrificed a year of competition, he's considering coming back because he was, he had graduated. Okay. So he was going to come back or he's considering coming back and beginning his his, um, MBA. Oh, okay. Yeah. And playing golf because of the eligibility. Uh, The young lady from Germany, she had um, graduated as well, but she is going to come back. She's made the decision. So uh, the... In terms of the way their college career finished, the men were sort of disappointed because they'd been playing really well and were, I think, ranked fourth in the nation or something like that. Oh, wow. But, but you know, all I said to them was like, look, all of you guys are back next year. Yeah. We're not losing anyone. Right. Um, and so it's it's just something to build on and it's just something to not sort of cry over spilled milk. It's happened. Yeah. It's, it's strange. It's like unprecedented, I guess. But, you know, let's just look to what we can learn and build on from here. Yeah. It sounds like you have quite a, I mean, just like you said, quite an international team and quite an eclectic team in terms of where everyone is from around the world. Do you think that a big part of that is because you have shown them that it is possible to leave another country, come over here, find success and 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 make some changes? Do you think these kids would have ended up over here 
without you? I, I'd hope so. Um, but to uh, th- that extent, we've got a fantastic facility, so it's attractive. Yeah. And a lot of the kids that come over here and they and they go and visit schools and they come down to us in Georgia where the weather's good and our facilities are great and it's a successful program, that has a lot of influence on it. Um, but then again, too, at the Division Two level, um, if you're an American kid, some blue chip American kid, you're likely going to want to go to, in our case, Georgia or Georgia Tech or right. Auburn down the road, you know, if you can play on their team. So we snapping up a bunch of the talent internationally mm-hmm. that might be overlooked or they've been fantastic, but just the Division One coach hasn't noticed them. So, so that's how we're making our hay. I mean, like the young boy from Australia was one of their leading golfers down there. And the young man I mentioned, mentioned from Switzerland, he won the European Junior Amateur Tournament. So, I mean, these kids are good. Right. It's just, it's just like they were missed yeah. by some of the Division One programs. So, so there's some of that too. It's sort of, you know, out of necessity, I guess it's the mother of invention. So they just want to come over here and get a chance. And they know they'll get better here and it's good facilities. So it's worth their while. Yeah. Rich's family is primarily from the South. Um, the vast majority is in Georgia. Um, mm-hmm. Marietta, uh, um, Cumming, Macon, yeah. uh, all over. Um, but there is one member of the family right now that is choosing between colleges. He's a senior and he's up in the air between Georgia and Georgia Tech because yeah. that's like what, just like you were saying, that's what kids do. That's where kind of they're guided to choose between these two schools and, and they don't really look at at other places unless there is a sports team kind of like yours that kind of draws in a in a different way. Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, if I'm in some recruiting battle with a kid, um, you know, Georgia, for argument's sake, I mean, obviously their golf program is very good, but they bring a kid in there on a visit and they take him to a football game on a yeah. Saturday. You know, it's, yeah. it, there's no comparison to what you'd get at Columbus State. So, you know, they, the, the local kids, the in-state kids are going to want to go to the in-state institutions because they've grown up, you know, watching football and hearing right. the stuff on the news. So it's part of the, you know, who they are. Um, ours is just a viable alternative for an aspirant young professional who wants to develop his or her game. Yeah. I'd, I'd love for you to tell us about your facility. I read about it online and it just sounds absolutely incredible. And, and what you've been able to do over the past five years to not only raise the money to make it happen, but develop it over the past few years into into an internationally known training facility. Um, I was fortunate. We, we were very fortunate with this. Um, it, it was it was born of me because when I was here in college in the early 90s, we played and practiced at a facility about 15 miles away from the campus. And so as an international kid, if you didn't have a car, oh, right. you were reliant on someone else to get to and from practice and to and from qualifyings and stuff. And so that made it hard. So when I came back, it was always a bit of a goal of mine to try and make it a bit easier, you know, for the college student. Mm-hmm. And we've had some fantastic support through the decades because the program's been good. And there was and a lot of family support for our programs with the six national titles we've won. And there was a, there's a man, Billy Key, who's just been a, he's been a godsend to us, to be honest with you. And, and he met with me one day after he'd given us a lot of support and he said he wanted to just put us in the place to never have to concern ourselves. And so I'm basically going to give you this gift. This should take care of the program. And I turned it around. And I said to him, I want to build a golf facility. And he's, He wasn't that for the idea initially. And so I convinced him and he goes, okay, well, I'll consider this, but it's got to be done right. And I wanted to help you with recruiting. So we pitched the idea and the university had the land and it's right next to campus. And so, you know, it therein lay the inspiration. It happened. You know, some folks jumped in behind it and helped us. And now it's just the kind of place where if you want to get better for better at golf, it's got everything you need. Right. You know, short game, long game, all the technology you need and stuff like that. So we've got everything. But it's it's thanks to a few families, especially Billy Key in town here, that sort of saw the vision mm-hmm. and uh, jumped in behind it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, it's really fortunate because <laughs> when you think about 2015 to now in terms of Georgia weather, y'all have kind of 
I don't know, joined the North in a sense, like That's with true. ice storms and snowstorms. Like y'all have had worse weather than we've had in Cincinnati for a couple years in a row. Um, so it, it allows them to keep practicing where kids were used to playing year round in the South. And it's gotten a little bit more challenging as it's gotten colder and snowier and icier, especially like toward the end of the season or like right in the middle of your, your college season. Yeah, we do have uh indoor hitting bays that you can close up and, the one side has a um, simulator in there so you can play, you know, golf courses and such too. So it has made life a little easier um, you know, to be able to hit from indoors to out. But the truth of it is, um, with some of the vicious storms we've gotten through here, even so, if some kid's hitting from indoors and the, the roller door is open, you know, with lightning cracking around the place, yeah. we are defensive, you know, with the children saying, look, if there's storms overhead, be a little careful. In fact, there's university policy that says we need to suspend activity. So, so the you know, well-being is still, I guess, the ultimate watchword. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'd love to transition over into some of your commentating. So you have a very well-known podcast, On The Mark. Um, I was listening to your interview with Webb this morning. We've had Paul Tesori and Michelle Tesori on our podcast. So um, obviously love to hear Webb and just hear how they they approach things from different sides. Um, yeah. So tell us about how that got started, because it got started as radio and then uh-huh. moved to podcast. And you were, I mean, obviously on the very forefront of podcasting, in my opinion, because that, <laughs> that wasn't really a thing in 2015 or it wasn't yeah. what it is today. Well, who knew? I mean, when I had, I was a play-by-play announce guy for the tour uh, with the radio, and then through that, the guy who basically ran the radio stuff said to me, he goes, do you want to do a live streaming show? And I was like, sure, you know, I just <laughs> things to do. And so that lasted for a season, but our, our window was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from, I think it was 11 till 1 or something like that. And it's a strange sort of a time for folks to to log on and listen to golf chat and stuff like that. So it was doing okay, but not so great. And then at the end of the year, he reached out and he goes, we're going on demand. And I was like, all right, whatever that means. (laughs) And he said, well, yours is going to become a podcast. And I was like, cool, what do I have to do? (laughs) Whatever that means. And And he's like, well, just record the stuff and package it. And so we did. And it just began as like golf chat. If you listen to the first few, I'm embarrassed that they're still available in the internet. And then I was just looking for guests and content. And so I just started to call up golf instructors and it suddenly became, cause we, I, we watched the numbers spike then and it suddenly became apparent that golfers just want to play better. Mm-hmm. You know, if they're watching golf on Sunday afternoon, they want to get a tip somehow. Yes. And, and so I started bringing coaches on and some players and, and the numbers started to grow. And all of a sudden we sort of became the place, even as a PGA tour podcast, where it was all just instruction and, and you're going to download if you want golf insights on mm-hmm. how to play the game better. And that worked for me because, you know, it's, it's, it's not that big a deal for me to give an interview. I'll have a few things maybe I want to touch or I'll have a few, um, elements that I'd like to sort of build a podcast around, Mm -hmm. I guess. But if the conversation just drifts somewhere, um, because I'm an instructor and I've taught high level players and beginners, I can sort of keep the conversation going on. And so it it opens up the guests that we have on to, I guess, get more comfortable. And so when they do that, they, they spout more information. And so it's, it's grown and it's to a thing, it's to a place where it's sort of happened it's happening despite me. You know, we just reach out to folks and get them on. And, and I'm just the guy basically allowing the bright mind that joins us to talk for about 25, 30 minutes. Yeah. And it's, it's been fun. Um, I enjoy doing it. It's, it's, it, it's, it's very mobile for me too, because when I'm traveling, I've just got the stuff that goes with me. Right. And so, uh, it, it's cool that way. I mean, now we, I mean, we have a two, two and a half million downloads or whatever it is. And I, I still wonder how, but you know, <laughs> here we are in the midst of our fifth season. Yeah, yeah. Over 400 episodes. I mean, it's it's absolutely incredible. We um we were looking at at some of your numbers like I said when we were researching it and it's like it's crazy to see how many people out there just like you said are just looking for 
good content, great content, tips, um, interesting interviews, just people that they want more access to. I think mm -hmm. that's that's what it's all about because I think it's so hard to get access to professional players or coaches or anything like that on a on a free basis, obviously, but even just yeah. on like a day to day basis. Well, you know what. It, it, it was a little self-serving, I guess, to, for me initially, where, you know, when I was a young instructor and I worked with some good players in the European tour and on the PGA tour, and I was trying to make a career of this, but never really hitting the home run, if you will, even though I worked with guys that won big tournaments um, because I wasn't on the front of a magazine. Right. And so it, this was always a burr in the saddle, I guess. And so when I began this, I was like, okay, I'm going to find people that haven't been exposed just yet, and I'm going to let them have a voice. Mm -hmm. And we've un we've uncovered some great. I mean, there's some folks now that are blowing it up instruction wise on on the internet. Yeah. And the one guy, Shaheen Nakjavani, actually was quoted. Uh, the the document was sent to me with some magazine saying, "Well, I got my first. I got my start on the On the Mark podcast." <laughs> And this made me so excited. That's because, incredible. Yeah, it's give it's giving because who knows? I mean, there might be the world's best golf instructor mm -hmm. somewhere who no one's ever discovered. Yes. And it's and now it's my sort of mission, not just to bring understanding to the listener, but my mission has been to find this individual. Yeah. And give them a voice because, you know, if we can, then golf grows because people are going to, you know, get some of the best insights. And absolutely, and like you say, we've I think our downloads are. It's over 125 countries. And you'll be astounded some of the places that are downloading for golf instruction. And now they get to hear from Webb Simpson yeah, or someone. Yeah. Something they never really would. Yeah. When I was absolutely. in South Africa, you know, our golf digest when I was growing up was no, nothing like this. I used to get, um, someone used to give me old magazines that I'd cut the swing sequences out. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Just certain places in the world don't have the access that most folks in the United States do. And so by way of this, if you can get the thing downloaded on Wi-Fi, you can hear from some of the great minds in the game, which um, is awesome as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Is it – what's more challenging, doing live commentating – um, and knowing that as soon as you say something, there's no chance to edit it because someone already has it on Twitter, um, mm -hmm. or kind of preparing for these podcasts and knowing who's coming on and, and kind of what you're, what you're going to be talking about. That's a really good question, uh, Amy. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure they, 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 they're difficult in their own rights. Um, uh, in, in terms of the television, the announcing stuff, I, I just laugh when I hear a year and see us get ripped on social media. <laughs> something I've said, <laughs> okay? Because I, I want to say I want to give a person a microphone and put them there and say, okay, bear in mind you've got gallery here and yeah. you're, you're complaining that you're standing in their way, and then you've got a player over there who's going to complain if you are overheard, uh -huh. and then you've got to say something insightful in a window of about seven seconds. Yeah, yeah. And that's not supposed to be something you can see on the screen, which is a graphic or what the guy's doing. So you awake and all of my work on course is done between shots because I'm watching then to see what I can bring to it to enhance the picture on the next Jeez. shot. So it's not as easy as people think. No, um, I can't imagine it would be. No, <laughs> but, but it's, it, it's sort of, I guess, I don't know if it comes naturally to me, but, but it sort of does because having played, having caddied, um, and having done radio, because with radio, I have to, dis I had to then describe everything that you couldn't see. Mm -hmm. So you look wide and you, and so now as a on course announcer, I see what the player is doing, but you're looking for everything else there, something that you might not see on TV. So it sort of comes naturally, uh, I think after the years of time in radio. And um, so, so it's challenging in its own right. And, and the podcast stuff initially, you know, like if, if you get a special guest kind of thing. Like I interviewed Gary Player the one time and I was nervous, even though he's like a mentor to me, because you want to do it right. Mm -hmm. But I'm in a place now where I'm like, I'm just going to talk golf with someone yeah. for a little while. And and I'll be honest with you, ours doesn't get edited. We 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 just do the interview. If there's bloopers and stuff in there, it just goes. That's so, that's pretty much how ours is too, because I think those are the, the best ones yeah. that well, don't sound thing. super um, produced. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I want it's like a, I want to exp expose the bright minds, but I want 
someone to feel like they're just sitting in on a fireside chat, if mm-hmm. you will. And so for the podcast, I, I, I'll know what I'm going in with. I'll, I'll research the person a bit if I don't know them. Um, and uh, so I guess the podcast is the easier of the two right now. But but it doesn't mean that I don't I don't have a sense of anticipation if there's some special kind of a guest coming on. Yeah, that's how I was. I was like sitting downstairs preparing myself for this one, and I'm like, it's just Mark. It's fine. Like he's he's just, <laughs> we're just talk. gonna talk golf. It's no yeah. big deal. But I mean, I, I do think like as at the beginning and and moving into some of we had a, a couple um, bigger names like right at the beginning, and then. Um, we're starting to, to get some bigger ones, obviously like you. And I'm like, I just have to remember that everyone's a person and that a lot of these people tend to be equally as nervous as I am. Um, but also yeah. so many people that we've talked to haven't been on podcasts before. You obviously have, you're a little different, but, um, a lot of people haven't been on a podcast and they're like, we don't know what to do. I'm like, you just talk, you don't have to do anything. Just yeah. talk. I got some great advice from my wife and she said to me, she goes, you have to just be careful, you know, having been in golf for so long and being an instructor of some repute mm-hmm. that, that, that you don't consider things that you find trite mundane to someone else. Mm-hmm. She's like, you could say the simplest thing in the world or bring it up in conversation and to someone somewhere, that's going to be like gold. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and I try and remember that when I'm talking with folks because – I'll, if some if, if something's going well with a with a guest, I'll just let them talk. Mm-hmm. But then I'll pick something and drill down on it a little bit because I don't ask questions really. I'll just make a statement and let you respond. <laughs> and then when you start responding, I sort of see where you are, and I'll just shepherd you towards where the things want to go. But but I, so I think that sort of allows the person to feel comfortable mm-hmm. a little bit more. You know, when it's just like, hey, you and I are chatting, and um, and in the end, whatever comes out will. I go in with a goal of having a title for the thing, mm-hmm. but I can tell you if I had to do 10, probably six of those come out with a different title at the end of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's really interesting. I mean, I, I think it's, um, I was in human resources. That was my career. Um, just until about a month and a half ago and I transitioned out of that. Um, but that's, that's what it always felt like with interviewing for just yeah. positions, like for, for jobs and everything. Um, so I tried to try to, to just bring out the positivity of, of whoever I'm talking to, which is great. I'm glad, glad you do that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just got to let, again, my goal with the podcast is to help the listener to understanding because information is rampant on the mm-hmm. internet right now. Mm-hmm. And somewhere in the back of my head, there's Harvey Penick saying, you know, if the doctor says one aspirin, don't go and take the bottle. Yeah, and then I then I build on that, and I'm like, well, if the, I wouldn't go into another man's medicine chest and go and take what he's taking, so I try and just empower the listener to information so they can understand the concept, mm-hmm. and then I, I think that happens when the individual who we're talking with feels comfortable enough just to chat. Yeah, because you know I try and avoid all the jargon and this sort of stuff because <laughs> sometimes it can get a little too much. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to chat about something we have not really talked about. Um, th- we've talked about your your um, the college team and everything, but you were the captain for the Palmer Cup, mm, yeah. and there was a lot of um, obviously that was in in just June of last year. There was a lot of conversation around the international team and how challenging it was for the president's cup for the team to come together. And there was a lot of comparison between the European team with the Ryder cup versus the international team with the president's cup. Um, I'd love to understand what your thoughts are around that. And if you faced any similar challenges with the Palmer cup in terms of like y'all won. So congratulations. Mm -hmm. That was great. Um, But trying to bring together a team of players, or is it just, I mean, any college players are just kind of challenging to all bring together when they've all been competing against each other. No, it's true. Um, look, if if it was if these matches were just singles matches, mm-hmm. you could just send this individual that speaks Korean mm-hmm. out there, and the the common language is golf. Mm-hmm. But in matches like the Ryder Cup and the Presidents Cup and the Palmer Cup and the Walker Cup, you you the bulk of the tournament. Is, is combination stuff. It's foursomes and four mm-hmm. balls. And, and in the Palmer Cup, I mean, I, I can't, I, there were two, four, I think there were like six sessions before the singles or maybe five, four sessions. 
And so that's already four points per individual. And, and if you just do the math, that speaks to the value of playing alternate shot well and playing, you know, best ball properly. Mm -hmm. So it is a challenge for the international team to, to group personalities together and to group folks that compre uh, their, their games complement each other together. And then just to group folks together who get along well. And so when we got in there, it was a fast turnaround for us because it was a men's and a ladies team and, and Jan Dowling was the ladies. She looked after the ladies side of, of the stuff alongside Rhea Scott. And I had a young man, Robert Duck, who's from England as my assistant coach. And I sort of oversaw the thing and I said to them, okay, we, the first thing we're going to do is put people together who look like they could work. And they, we just started to break down language, put languages together. Mm -hmm. And then we let them go out and play. And then we just got up to, up to two folks that weren't going very well in practice and saying, hey, why don't you just flip flop and try with this person? So we sort of, it was like, I guess, Paul Azing's, Azinger's pod system. And then the, that evening, I said to them, I'm like, I want you guys to understand that no matter what language you talk and what, no matter what flag you, fl you play under, we are here with a mission. And the mission is to win the Palmer Cup. So you've got to put aside whatever your personal biases are if X is your partner, you've got to make the most of this and mm -hmm. we're going to do this. And we got dusted in the first session. We were like down eight to four. And the team was low. I mean, they went into the first day, I think almost too excited. And we were down and I called them aside and the whole group of someone took this awesome picture of us. I was talking and they were surrounding me and I said to them, what do you see? And the, they were like, we're down, we're down, we've lost, whatever. And I was like, I'll tell you what I see. I see a team who's earned four points in the first session. There's another 25 odd points available. Mm -hmm. And if we just keep doing what we're doing, we're going to be okay. They came out the next morning and I think won the session like nine, two, nine and a half, two and a half. Oh, geez, yeah. Then in the afternoon, they doubled down. We had built such a big lead after the 36 whole day. It was crazy. And then from there, just the emotion took over. And I had one rule. I'm like, if you are finished with your match, and you see another match finish. I want you to go out there, hug your playing, your, your teammates, support them, let's cheer. Because we were in Arkansas and it was all America versus our little team. Yeah. And in the end, I could see all of the, the American folks just looking at this crowd going, they were so, so galvanized behind the mission and by, by supporting their teammates that it carried them to the finish. And, and, and it was, it eventually became a thing where we just walked along as me, certainly. And just smiled at how this crowd just took the the bull by the horns and ran with it. That's awesome. I mean, and, and so Trevor is doing it next year for the president. Yeah. Huh? Any uh, uh -huh. any tips for him? Uh, Trevor will do just fine. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm lobbying for a cart driver job or something like that for him. <laughs> uh, no, It'll Trev, be right down the street from you, too. won't be too yeah, far. Really. Well, hello. Um, Trevor, Ernie else did it right at Royal Melbourne. and, and But for... You know, one or two funky bounces and a big charge by the Americans on a, on a Sunday, the internationals would have won. And Trevor was there front and center mm -hmm. watching our captain Ernie did. So he knows the thing and we've talked about it some and 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 he said he's just going to continue with a plan and allow the players almost to, to dictate who they want to play alongside. And, and they'll look at the data and stuff and go with that. I thought it was really interesting um, with the President's Cup this year. The Ryder Cup, in my opinion, has always gotten more press than the mm -hmm. President's Cup. Um, what do you think that shift was this year with the President's Cup getting so much um, like media attention? Well, it got a shot in the arm. I, I think the time of the year helps mm, because okay. there's not much golf on, uh, yeah. uh, uh, on at the time. And so it was the only golf coverage and it was sort of prime time a little bit, you know, with yeah. golf down in Australia. So folks were watching. Yeah. And then with the Americans being down, you know, that suddenly will draw some American attention yes. you know, to try and get your team across the line. And mm -hmm. so that happened. And then obviously with the internationals being up for the majority of the tournament, the international fans got behind the thing. Mm -hmm. So I think it was exactly what the tournament needed. Um, and I, I think funny enough, with the Americans pulling through and winning at the end, I think – was the right result, even though I would have been pulling for the international crowd. Mm -hmm. But because they were down and then scrapped and clawed their way back and their stars came through at the right time for them, yeah. 
I think it was great for the tournament because now people want to see if they can do this again. So, oh yeah, I, I, I think Royal Melbourne was big for the international team, certainly, but big for the tournament. Yeah, I remember um, watching kind of those final few minutes. We were at a holiday party and everyone was outside playing a game and I was inside watching the tournament <laughs> and like running outside and giving like play by plays. I'm like, sorry, guys, it's like one more hour. I'll be out here in a few minutes. It's really cold out there. It's really warm in here and there's uh, golf yeah. on. <laughs> I'll be with you in a few. <laughs> it was it was fun to watch. I was on the uh, PGA to a live announce crew for it and uh we were excited. I mean, it, it was it, it was a really really cool tournament. Yeah, yeah, it was. I was doing um, some texting back and forth with some people as it was happening, and it was just like as you were getting to the countdown and figuring out where the half points and the whole points were, and and how everything was like breaking down in that final like couple of hours. It was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah, I mean, isn't it isn't it nuts that well all these events, even a stroke play event, can come down to one shot in the yeah. end or one putt, so you know. Absolutely. One bad bounce. So, yeah. So, so that that I think there were a lot of things about that event, the golf course, the teams, the captains, that that were great. But but just the drama of the of the finish was was I think was was very cool. I appreciated so many of the stories that were coming out about the players. Um, and Ernie just got absolutely incredible, incredible press, mm. and learning some of the things about him as a coach and not just seeing him as a player, um, it just, it it brings to me, it brings a different level of appreciation to the game to know what some of these players go through and experience and, and the challenges that they've faced to get where they are today, I think is just, it brings a a new life into the game too. Yeah, it does. And, and if you think about it, if let's say for argument six, the Americans were dominant. You know, all the media over here would have been talking about the Americans and like, let's say Abraham answer would have just been one of the whipping boys. He yes. would have been exactly that. But with him sort of leading the charge, this yeah. handsome looking dude that was beating people all left yeah. and right. Yeah. All of a sudden, they television had to build graphics on him mm-hmm. and they had to find more stuff on him. And Sung J M and C T Pan and, yes. and Mark Leishman and Cameron Smith, you know, these guys doing what they were doing, the television had to oblige and yeah. go okay, we can't just focus on Woods right now because this guy is doing the business. Right. So again, it, it, it built some personalities and I, and it certainly put a charge in, in the in the team room of the international crowd because I think they believe now that it's possible. Because mm-hmm. you know, America's, you look at the American team every year and it's like murder is a row. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> the average rank, I think I remember, I saw the statistic of the American team was like 11, the world rank. Yeah. And the average rank of the international squad was like 39 or something. Yeah, yeah. So they were wildly outmatched. Right. But again. You'd... But it was it was incredible golf to watch. Yeah. Absolutely yes. incredible. And, and these things are about team matches. Mm-hmm. You know, singles makes up a very small percentage of the overall match. Yeah. It's funny because after after the President's Cup, Sung J M did not have a lot of press going into the president's cup and now if he is playing in a tournament which i'm i'm pretty convinced that guy never sleeps either but he is all like they are always showing him i mean he has like a cult following now too they have to i mean the guy's legitimate yeah he's (laughs) just he's just a beast i don't even i don't even know yeah and and, and the cool thing about him you know he's gonna Born a young generation of Korean golfers yes. too. Uh, yes. Let's say he hangs on and wins the FedEx Cup. That'll mm-hmm. be massive. Oh, right? it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's so so. There's be a professional golf right now is in a good spot. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Mark, what is next for you? What do you see? Obviously, we're we're on a little bit of a break right now. But what does the next year, three years, five years look like for you? What do you anticipate for growth of the game? Uh, again, I think the game at the professional level is healthy. I think that with, with the television contracts just being signed, you know, golf will be exposed to folks for the next 10 years, which is great, which is good for the growth of the game. Um, I think golf being available on different platforms, like with PGA tour live Mm -hmm. and golf TV and all these sorts of things that you stream right now. I think that's awesome. Um, I remember being in, as a kid in South Africa. We only saw two events on television. It was oh, the wow. Masters, the final nine holes of the Masters, and the Open Championship. Yeah. So now you've got kids all over the globe 
if they have access to the internet, can see the greats play. So there's the inspiration for the young golfer over there, which I think is good. Um, but still, you know, the game is very expensive. And, it is. And as, as long as there's a continued proliferation of, you know, the game being made available to more kids and to more people, I think the game will grow. I, I don't know enough, honestly, to comment on where it is right then. But I can tell you, as the parent of a child, it's expensive for them to play golf. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're quicker, easier things that kids could do that are way more cost effective. Yeah. But like I say, with, with the heroes being more available, like my youngest, Sophia, she went to the toy championship with us last year and she was on the side of the ropes and, and Tiger and Rory were in the final group. Uh, it was last year, maybe the, the year before. Um, and when Tiger walked past, I watched this child who had never seen Tiger Woods before just be overcome. Yeah. And I was standing, uh, my, my wife took a photo of her holding herself in the, in, on her face. Like. <laughs> so with the kids seeing this stuff, the, the, the ruling bodies need to capitalize on this mm -hmm. and continue to make the game easier, easier and more accessible yeah. is, is what I'd like to see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Mark, it has been an absolute pleasure. I had so much fun chatting with you today. Are you ready to play a quick nine? Sure. All right. Awesome. What is the hardest course to call on tour? That's a good question. <laughs> um, give me a second here. Yeah, you're good. A any golf course that's windy mm, mm -hmm. be because your sound travels so much more. So, okay. so if, if, if you're playing down in Florida, like PGA national for argument's sakes, if there's water around the place and the wind's blowing sideways, your sound carries very quick, a long way. So, so it's, it's hard for the on course individual when you're in a windy joint where the sound can carry. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite type of music? Rock always has been <laughs> heavy metal and rock. Um, are you a pimento cheese or egg salad kind of guy? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pimento cheese one time because it's tradition uh -huh. at Augusta National and then probably egg salad thereafter. See, there, I'm, I like that answer. <laughs> I'm egg salad all the way, rich as pimento cheese all the way. So I like the combination. I do them both. <laughs> I, do the, I, do them both. I, I will always have a pimento cheese sandwich just because of the tradition. Of yeah. It. And it just doesn't taste the same anywhere else but there. So I, I can appreciate that. What golfer did you idolize growing up? Can I give you a few? Yeah. May I give you a few? Please. Um, Gary Player, obviously. Yeah. Um, Seve Ballesteros. Mm -hmm. Greg Norman. And, uh, you know, in my latter days when I maybe wised up a little bit, <laughs> I, I just hold Bobby Jones in biblical esteem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, there, um, it's, it's interesting because I think right now that there is so much more press on Bobby Jones, um, and Ben Hogan and some of the, just some different players that you didn't hear a lot about for quite a few years. But now that we are seeing, um, the PGA and golf channel and NBC, like every CBS, they're all trying to show us different things. Yeah. I think there are just, there's just so much more access to some really fascinating, um, players that, that you don't see anymore. I'll tell you a funny story. Obviously, you know, as a young golfer, my first golf book that I ever was given was Ben Hogan's five fundamentals, you know, the modern fundamentals of golf, mm -hmm. five lessons. Um, I, for a while, as he moved from the PGA tour to the, uh, champions tour, taught Larry Myers, coach Larry Myers. And Larry's a tremendous guy and I've probably learned more from him than he ever learned from me. But obviously, there was that chip in on Greg Norman and Seve Ballesteros. And I remember I've just said that when I was growing up, they were the two golfers. Yeah, Because, yeah. you know, with television that we got, you saw Greg and you saw Seve yeah. because it was European <laughs> to our stuff. Right. And so I summoned up the courage one day. You know, we'd been together and he had had a victory, which was good. And, and so we're talking the one afternoon and I said to him, Larry, I've got to tell you something. And he's like, what's that? And I said, do you realize that I hated you for <laughs> large majority of your life <laughs> and he looks at me he's like what do you mean and i'm like well you chipped in on two of my heroes at the, well you knocked out Sevy was knocked out on the 10th hole at the masters and then you chip in on greg 
And I'm like, and all I can picture in the back of my head is this guy jumping and leaping with this purple and black shirt on. And I didn't like you at all. <laughs> and, and how strange the world is and how it turns because I end up, how many years later, go teaching him. And, and yeah. now, now I count him a dear friend. That's awesome. <laughs> That's a good one. Because I feel like it's so easy to um, – to kind of villainize some of these players when yeah. your favorite player loses and just be like, oh, come on. Like, they were they were right there. This is all your fault. <laughs> There's a lesson that I learned from my mom. Um, you know, when she watches, she's obviously into it. But, you know, she just wants to see what a little boy Trevor is doing. And there was one event, I, you know, oftentimes I'm not there with them. But we were just mm-hmm. walking along. I'd done with my commitments for the day and watching Trevor play. And he was in contention. And so I looked at the leaderboard and someone had made a bogey. And I was like, yes, that's good for Trevor. <laughs> my mom, I'm 40 at this stage, she grabs me by my ear and she says, don't ever do that again. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she goes, because that boy somewhere has a mother that wants to throw up in a bush because <laughs> things are going wrong for him. So she goes, remember that he's a human being and things going wrong for him. That, that, that's yeah, how it is for everybody. That's true. It's true. Yeah, you don't think about it, but I mean, I, I – I joke with Rich all the time. I'm like, can we just watch football like we watch golf? Like, I'm not a football <laughs> fan. I I have some very strong opinions on some football rules that are out there. But I'm like, in golf, 99% of the time, you're rooting for whoever's winning. Can't we just do that with football, too? It would just be so much less stressful, so much more enjoyable. <laughs> He doesn't agree. Well, yeah, I mean, it's I, <laughs> look, everyone has their place. And obviously, all of the folks that are very critical of, you know, golfers and announcers and whoever mm-hmm. in social media, remember that lesson from my mother. Yeah. Those folks have a mother, too. Yep, <laughs> you know? absolutely. And, and, absolutely. OK, this is um, this is one that Rich and I have some strong opinions on, too. Are you a sweet tea or an unsweet tea drinker? Not really a tea drinker. Um, I'm okay with that answer too. <laughs> I, uh, but if I had to choose just cause I'm trying to avoid the dad belly, I'm probably going to go on sweet tea. Yes. But sweet tea is really nice. <laughs> oh, I, that, so I am like through and through from the North. I'm from Cincinnati. Rich loves well, he's his, from Georgia. He yeah, does sweet he, tea. There's no doubt. He does. We went to the masters one year and I picked up a, an unsweet tea and the women in like the food area were like, ma'am, ma'am, that's an unsweet tea. I'm like, I'm from Cincinnati. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm, cause I'm, there's I'm like convinced. two unsweets and then like three dozen sweet teas that are out there. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm the one that's going to drink all your unsweet tea. Yeah, I think if uh, if if Jesus had been at uh, at the wedding in in the Bible, his first miracle would have been yeah in the south to turn water into sweet tea as opposed <laughs> right, to wine. <laughs> exactly, I completely agree with you on that one. Um, what is your ideal way to spend a weekend? I'm just taking it easy, watching sport. I, I love football. <laughs> Who do you Sunday root for? afternoon, uh, the Falcons. Mm. Just, well, Back, we're backwards and forwards. Yeah, I, I would say just taking it easy for a bit, um, you know, relaxing and just spending time with the family and then football on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. What was your first job? With IMG. I was a sp- golf agent. But no, no, no. Back, back in high school for some extra money, I, I was a bartender for a little while. Okay. All right. What is your go-to tech tool? Golf tech tool. Hmm. Probably the flat scope launch monitor. Okay. Um, I, 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 I'm not handcuffed to it, but you know, having that and having a little portable Mevo is, uh, is, is just super helpful you know, to get data, but also to help an, an individual to understand that, hold on, what I feel might not be enough. Mm-hmm. So let's say we're looking for a certain pattern. You say, well, you're on your way, but you're not there just yet. You know, because as soon as they start seeing something, then they're all right with it. And and those sorts of things help them to put a feel to where they're trying to be. Okay. All right. And then last question, what is your favorite tournament to attend? Um, I have a few. Obviously, the Masters is always special. Mm-hmm. The Open Championship is, is an experience if you've never been. Um, but I just like to go down to Bay Hill. because Yeah, Arnie's I've heard really incredible legend. things about Bay Hill. Yeah, Arnie's a legend. It's a nice time of the year. And I get to stay with my parents down there because they're right around the corner from the oh, from nice. year, of course. So uh, I stay with the folks, and, and Bay Hill is always a fun event. Were you with Trevor when he won? At the Masters? Yeah. That's incredible. What was it like? It's surreal. Uh, 
it was hard to f- it's still hard to fathom you know where there's young kids from south africa watching norman and jack and biasteros yeah. this crowd on tv and then one just getting to go there mm-hmm. is still i still can't my, i still pinch myself when i get on the grounds and uh and then obviously him playing in the tournaments and then winning is is beyond one's wildest dreams it, it's i couldn't begin to describe it that's awesome well mark thank you again so much i had such a blast chatting with you where do we continue the conversation online where can we find you um i, I have a website mark and on twitter and instagram i'm at mark underscore Immelman. and then uh Check out the podcast wherever you go and get yours. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much. I look forward to golf getting started again and hopefully being able to see you on a course very soon. I appreciate you guys for what you do. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Thanks for joining me today. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the action. See you soon.